Did they handle axe or knife to take away their victim's life? No sooner done than in the chest they crammed their lately welcome guest. I don't understand the song. Tell me plain how they did it. I'll show you how they did it, Joseph. I'll show you how they burnt them. No. Put your hand down. How can I show you, man? This is how they did it, Joseph. Greyfriars Churchyard, in the heart of Old Edinburgh. The last word in respectable death were the solid and prosperous citizens of the town lie in their ornate and imposing tombs. But there are also reminders here of murkier aspects of our past, because Greyfriars Churchyard was the scene of the first recorded instance of suspected body snatching in Scotland in 1678. A young gypsy who'd been hanged for murder and buried here, whose body was missing from its grave next morning. It was the start of an extraordinary epidemic of grave robbing in Scotland that would last for some 150 years and culminate in one of the most sensational criminal trials in Scotland's legal history, involving the two men whom legend has cast as the archetypal body snatchers, Burke and Hare. To counter the grave robbers, families started enclosing their burial plots in veritable little fortresses of stone and iron. And throughout the 18th century, a new style of funerary furniture blossomed in Scotland's churchyards, protective iron cages over the graves known as mort safes. These mort safes, or death safes, developed into a minor art form in Scotland. There aren't very many of them left, but one of the finest surviving examples can be found here in the old Colton burial ground in Edinburgh. But what was the real reason behind it all? Why was it ever necessary to go to all this trouble and expense? What made grave robbing such a temptingly profitable business in Scotland for 150 years? One group of men always had a special need for the dead. The scientific study and teaching of medicine has always depended on the dissection of human corpses. In 18th century Britain, strong religious and social objections meant that the only bodies available for dissection were those of hanged murderers, suicides and orphans. For doctors, this was intolerable. This was a period of pioneering advances in surgery and anatomy. More sophisticated techniques were making possible the preservation of specimens. And doctors were beginning to try to understand the causes of disease and deformity. and medicine was also becoming big business. By the 1820s, there were 1,000 medical students at Edinburgh University, and to teach them not just a professor of anatomy, Alexander Munro, but also a number of extramural lecturers competing for a hungry market. Far more bodies were needed than were legally available. So fresh graves were systematically robbed, not just by medicos, but by professionals, or resurrectionists, as they were called. Some doctors may have had scruples. I don't think that I can go on, sir. What the devil do you mean? You've got your lodgings in a certain stipend. I thought I'd arranged everything for you. I saw the woman whose son's body was delivered last night. 
That man took the body from Greyfriars. I knew the woman. I knew the little dog on the grave. He killed the dog. And that's why you won't be a doctor? Not if I have to be a party to things like that, Dr. McFarlane. That is, I was an assistant once. I had to deal with men like Gray. Do you think I did it because I wanted to? Do you think I want to do it now? But I must. You must. Ignorant men have damned the stream of medical progress with stupid and unjust laws. And if that dam will not break, the men of medicine have to find other courses. You understand me? Yes, but this woman and her son... I'm sorry for the woman, but her son might be alive today if more doctors have been given the opportunity to work with more human specimens. As for me, I let no man stop me when I know I'm right. When I know I need those lifeless subjects for my students' enlightenment and my own knowledge. And if you're a real man, want to be a good doctor, you'll see it as I see it. By the 1820s, the cemeteries of central Edinburgh were being guarded round the clock by night watchmen and church vigilantes. The resurrectionists had to spread their activities further afield to remote country kirkyards. Eventually, the trade extended as far as London and even Ireland. In 1826, a new lecturer set up shop in Surgeon Square in Edinburgh. Dr. Knox, FRSE, will commence his annual course of lectures on the anatomy and physiology of the human body on Tuesday the 4th November at 11 a.m. Dr. Robert Knox, whose name would forever after be linked with those of Burke and Hare, was then 35 and had worked as a military surgeon at Waterloo and in South Africa before finding his true vocation as a lecturer in anatomy and curator of the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. He was a very brilliant lecturer. He was a great collector of comparative anatomy material. But whether he ever did any great, in, made any great innovation in the knowledge of anatomy is a little bit more doubtful. His hall was regarded as the mecca to which people came from all over the United Kingdom. He ran two classes each day. He had to duplicate his lectures because of his success. Knox's great popularity as a teacher was perhaps only in part due to his undoubted skill and his oratorical gifts. It was uh, also largely due to the fact that he always did have a considerable supply of fresh dissection material, substantially more than that of his competitors. And it was uh, this, as much as anything, I think, which filled his lecture theatre to capacity twice daily. Arrangements have been made to secure, as usual, an ample supply of anatomical subjects. And so we come to Dr Knox's most famous suppliers. This magnificent aqueduct, some 25 miles from Edinburgh, carries the Edinburgh and Glasgow Union Canal across the River Avon. Like so many of our railways and canals, the Union Canal was built with the sweat of the brow of many an Irish navvy, including that of a certain William Burke. Now, he worked somewhere along this stretch for a year or two around 1820. He himself was in his late 20s by then. He'd been born in County Tyrone in Ireland, he'd served in the army, and then after a dispute with his father-in-law, he emigrated to Scotland, abandoning his wife and family in Ireland. And while he was here, in a village just down the road, he met and took up with a rather disreputable Scots lady called Helen MacDougall. They moved around the country for a few years, and then in 1827, they went to Edinburgh. <laughs> somewhere around here in the grass market in the lee of Edinburgh Castle 
that Burke met a hard-drinking Irish brawler called William Hare. He was about the same age as Burke, came from the same part of Ireland, and had also worked on the canal. By this time, he'd become a hawker with a hand barrow of his own and had fallen in with an Irish widow who owned a rooming house. Burke and Helen MacDougall moved in with them, Burke to set up as a cobbler. William Burke was attractive, agreeable, marvellously pleasant manners, seemed to have quite a way with him as far as the ladies were concerned, could dance extremely well and play a musical instrument, and seems to have been very popular. Hare, on the other hand, seems to have been a cruelly brutalised kind of person, which therefore meant that he became a cruelly brutal person. McLean tells rather a grim story about them going out to a pub on one occasion. There's drink uh, being taken. Uh, the barman is not picking up the money. Each one is putting down the price of his drink in front of him. Then at the end of the evening, Hare gathers up all the money, puts it in his pocket, and uh, the rest of them are left looking at him. Whereupon Verk very quickly slips over to the barman, pays the shot out of his pocket. They go out of the pub. McLean, not apparently a very tactful man, turns to Hare and says, that was a pretty mean thing you did, leaving poor old Will Burke to pay the shot. And Hare knocks him down and kicks him in the face. Hare's lodging house was in a little street around here called Tanner's Close, now demolished. On the 29th of November, 1827, an old soldier who'd been staying in Hare's lodging house died. He owed Hare money for rent, and Hare decided to get his debt back by selling him to the doctors. And it can't have been the first time that a lonely old wastrel fetched a bob or two in this way. Burke was enrolled to help. They got the body out of its coffin and substituted a sack of Tanner's bark for it. They set off, clutching their bundle, for the medical school of Edinburgh University. They paused here at the entrance to the university's old college to ask a student the way to Professor Monroe's rooms. And this chance encounter turned out to be a very momentous one because the student happened also to be a pupil of Dr. Knox's. And when he discovered the purpose of their mission, he persuaded them to go instead to Dr. Knox's premises in Surgeon Square. They took the body over to Dr. Knox's house, which used to stand hereabouts, and met three young assistants to the good doctor, all of them later to become pillars of the medical establishment. After a bit of humming and hawing, they came to the point and explained their business. The body was vetted by Dr. Knox himself, who didn't ask any questions about where it came from, and authorized a payment of seven pounds, 10 shillings. The assistants added that they'd be glad to see them back when they had any other body to dispose of. Well, here were riches indeed. This was infinitely better than working. Burke and Hare decided to assist the processes of nature and thus speed up the supply of human flesh for the anatomists. It's a curious irony of legend that these two men, who became a byword for body snatching and grave robbing as prototype resurrectionists, actually never robbed a single grave or dug up a single body themselves. They simply created corpses. They began to prowl the wines and closes of the old town looking for suitable prey. But they found it more effective to invite the victims back to Tanner's Close. A bottle is produced, more drink is taken, there's music, there's dancing, there's laughter, and finally, there's sleep. And then... Um, the methods in which they did it varied from time to time, but the particular technique which was associated with the word burking would be that here, shall we say, would sit on the legs and Burke would place the thumb underneath the chin and draw the fingers close and within a minute or two, in most instances, it seems to have been all over. Over the next 11 months, Burke and Hare murdered at least 16 people 
and carried their bodies to Dr. Knox's in a tea chest. Their waxwork notoriety was earned mainly at the expense of anonymous old tramps, but two of their victims were well-known characters. Mary Patterson was a beautiful young Edinburgh prostitute. She caused a bit of a stir when she arrived at Dr. Knox's table, for one of the good doctor's assistants had been in intimate contact with her only a few nights before. Daft Jamie was a harmless half-wit, but he was young and strong, and it took both Burke and Hare to finish him off. Surely Dr. Knox must have known that the bodies brought to him by Burke and Hare had been murdered. No. I think you can say that quite categorically, no. I think you may have to say that he didn't want to know where they came from. It was a dirty trade getting bodies for anatomists in those days. They came from resurrectionists and all sorts of things. And uh, these were just additional bodies which were in his dissecting room. William Burke himself, when he was in prison, made two confessions. Now, he went out of his way to say that Knox didn't know anything, except, and it's rather a sinister line, that Dr. Knox always remarked that there were nice, fresh bodies. Nice, fresh bodies from Burke and Hare. Uh, my own feeling was that Knox knew perfectly well that there was something extremely suspicious about them, and Knox's tremendous desire to brush away inquiry, to take an aloof attitude, is not simply the spirit of cold, pure science reaching such an abhuman level that it refuses to concern itself with anything but the inquiry, though that is part of the thing. But the other factor, which means a lot to me in Knox's case, is that Knox, who was a father and one of the most significant of all fathers of modern racialist thinking, quite definitely believed that most of these people would be far better dead, that they belonged to the lower races of men, and indeed in his book, Races of men advocated that the Celts be driven out of Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and presumably extirpated. Their lives were extremely cheap, and indeed their only use was as corpses. Yes, I'm quite certain he knew, and that there was a case against him, and that he should have been prosecuted. The firm of Burke and Hare, like many others, had its ups and downs. Hare, at one stage, suggested that Helen MacDougall should be converted into merchandise. Burke, to his credit, defended his girlfriend against such a fate, but agreed to substitute a country cousin of hers instead. By this time, Burke and Helen MacDougall could afford premises of their own. That house has gone too, but it was somewhere around here, and that was where the final act of the drama began. On Friday, October the 31st, 1828, Burke was out buying his morning shot of grog when he came across a destitute old Irish woman called Mrs. Doherty, who'd come to Edinburgh in search of her son. She was delighted to be told that Burke's mother was a Doherty too, and she gladly accepted an invitation to a party that evening, which was Halloween. Well, that night, Burke's house rang with drunken laughter and Irish songs and reels. The old lady herself joined in so enthusiastically she even injured a foot. Then neighbors heard the merrymaking give way to quarreling and scuffling. There was a cry of murder and then silence. Next morning, there was no sign of the old woman. When the neighbors asked about her, they were told that she'd got so drunk that she'd had to be put out of the house. But Burke's behavior was so peculiar, he seemed to be trying to fumigate the room with a bottle of whiskey, that they grew suspicious. And later, they returned to the room to take a look. And there, lying under a pile of straw in the corner, they found the naked body of Mrs. Doherty with blood around the mouth and the ears. The next day, the police, acting on information received, called at Dr. Knox's in Surgeon Square. In an unopened tea chest in the house, they found the body of Mrs. Doherty. Now, we happen to know that Burke and Hare had murdered at least 16 people by this time, but that's mainly through their later confessions. At this stage, they simply denied everything, except having sold a body to the doctors, which wasn't a crime in itself. And even though the woman seemed quite clearly to have died a violent death through suffocation, there was only circumstantial evidence as to who had murdered her, and that might not have been enough to convict. 
And so the Lord Advocate, determined to secure at least one conviction, decided that he had no alternative but to offer a deal to Hare, complete immunity from prosecution in exchange for turning King's evidence. I think he wanted to make certain he would rather have one rascal convicted uh, than two get away on a verdict of not proven, which was a distinct possibility, because the medical evidence with regard to quite a number of the bodies uh, was um, by no means conclusive of violent death. Whereas, you see, if uh, the jury believed the evidence of Hare, he gave a highly circumstantial account of how uh, uh, at least one of the victims was murdered and uh, the method by which that murder was effected. He had probably turned King's evidence because he saw an opportunity of getting out of the thing. On the other hand, it seems odd that an intelligent person wouldn't have seen that they were pressuring him for King's evidence because they didn't have a really good case, which meant, therefore, that Hare would be found not guilty and Burke would be found not guilty. And it did lead to one thing. If Hare had refused to turn King's evidence, then they would have had to make a far closer investigation of the arrival of the bodies at Dr. Knox's, and Knox would have been brought far more deeply into the thing. Hare's decision may very well have saved Knox's bacon. The trial, which took place here in Parliament House on Christmas Eve, 1828, was a pure piece of drama. The elite of the Scottish Bar turned out for both the prosecution and the defence. Now, in those days, when they did this sort of trial, they didn't muck about. The proceedings began at 10 o'clock in the morning. They went on all through the day and all through the night until next morning, Christmas Day, which wasn't a public holiday in Scotland in those days. Burke came to court charged with three separate murders, Mary Patterson, Daft Jamie, and Mrs. Doherty. But after much legal argument, the judges ruled that he had to be tried on each charge separately for fear of prejudice. Now, in the case of the third charge, the charge of murder of Mrs. Doherty, there was at least a body. And so the Lord Advocate decided to proceed with that charge against both Burke and Helen MacDougall. It also happened to be the one case in which Dr. Knox and his assistants had neither seen nor examined the body they were buying. The climax of the trial came when Hare, having calmly described the murder of Mrs. Doherty, was cross-examined by counsel for Helen MacDougall, the celebrated Henry Coburn. Now, sir, when Burke was on top of this person destroying her, where were you? I was sitting on the chair in the same room. How long was he dealing with her? I couldn't say how long. How long? About ten minutes. And did you sit in the chair? Yes. And did you sit ten minutes in that chair without stirring one hand to help her? Uh, yes. But all attempts by defence counsel to probe into the other activities of Burke and Hare were stifled by the blanket immunity given to Hare. Had you received money at various times from Dr Knox? I never did. Had you received any money from gentlemen representing themselves as Dr Knox's assistants? They'd never give it to me. Did you ever receive any money from Dr Knox's assistants? Burke might have had it paid to him by Dr Knox, and he could have given it to me. At 20 past nine on Christmas morning, after retiring for 50 minutes, the jury found William Burke guilty of the murder of Mrs. Doherty, but found the indictment against Helen MacDougall not proven, a verdict peculiar to Scots law. And when news of Burke's conviction reached the enormous crowd that had gathered out here in Parliament Square, it was cheered to the echo. William Burke, you have now no other duty to perform on earth but to prepare in the most suitable manner for appearance before the throne of Almighty God. Burke's preparations for death were extensive. He saw priests of several denominations and made two confessions that found their way into the newspapers. The impending execution aroused great excitement among the burghers of Edinburgh. My only apology for troubling you is my anxiety to have a sight of the execution tomorrow. Dear sir, I am promised a bit of the rope that hanged Burke. Would you like to have a bit preserved? I should like to know if you have secured a window for Burke's execution. Crowds of people continued to arrive, and by eight o'clock there were certainly not less than 20,000 persons within view of the scaffold. He waited only a few seconds on the drop. The drop immediately fell, and with a short but severe struggle, he expired. 
With Burke dead, popular fury turned on Helen MacDougall and on Hare. Daft Jamie's relatives tried to bring a private prosecution against Hare, but the court upheld his immunity. Hare was freed. He fled to London, and it's thought that he ended his days as a beggar in Oxford Street. The Edinburgh mob also turned on Dr. Knox. He was hanged in effigy and lampooned in every paper. But he was never prosecuted. The evidence may have been too weak. Or perhaps a prosecution of Knox would have brought to the surface things about Edinburgh medicine that many preferred hidden. But Knox's own medical career never recovered. Eventually he left Edinburgh and died in London in 1862. Paradoxically, William Burke himself has been given a kind of immortality by the medical profession. As a convicted murderer, he was publicly dissected by Dr. Knox's arch-rival, Professor Munro, and put on permanent display as directed by the court. William Burke, I trust that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved in order that posterity may keep in remembrance your atrocious crimes. So here he stands, 150 years old, unexpectedly short and insignificant a frame, condemned by the pious hope of the Lord Justice Clark never to enjoy a final resting place in hallowed soil. He shares a mahogany showcase with various other murderous types and ethnic specimens, stripped to the bone, just as he left Professor Monroe's dissecting table and articulated for all eternity. And I suppose it is real poetic justice to find him, of all people, on display in an anatomical museum. But long after both Burke and Hare were dead, the legend lived on. Children were cowed into instant obedience by the awful threat of, or Burke and Hare will get you. But the legend had one even more immediate and salutary effect. So great was the public revulsion created by the sensational revelations at the Burke and Hare trial of the gruesome traffic in bodies that Parliament at last was forced to move. In 1832, barely four years after the trial, the Anatomy Act was passed, legalizing the supply of bodies to medicine, thus putting an end to the violation of the sepulchres of the dead and the living in the name of science. <laughs> 